Governor Lane, President O'Kerty, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, and there are many students here, I'm glad to say. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Alan O'Hearn. I'm Director of the Whitaker Institute here at NUI Galway, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Monsignor de Bruin Memorial Lecture entitled Climate Change and the Irish Financial System, hosted by the Whitaker Institute. The running order this evening is that I will shortly invite the President of NUI Galway, Professor Kieran O'Hogarty, to introduce our distinguished speaker. And following Governor Lane's lecture, Professor Esther Tipman, who has recently joined the University School of Business and Economics and the Whittaker Institute as Professor of Strategy, Leadership and Change, will propose a vote of thanks and chair a questions and answer session with Government Lane, uh, Governor Lane and members of, of, of the audience. Uh, immediately after the event, I'd invite you to join us for teas and coffees in the foyer just outside this lecture theatre. Um, you know, when, when someone is held in such high regard as, as David Attenborough speaks about climate change and warns us of a disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years, then we know that we need to take the threat of climate change seriously and to act. Researchers at the Whittaker Institute working in multidisciplinary research clusters have been busy producing area, research in this area, a sample of which is on display in the, in the foyer. We are committed to continue to do so and to do more. Um, T.K. Whittaker, the Whittaker Institute is, is named after T.K. Whittaker. T.K. Whittaker's plan for econo economic development in the late 1950s transformed Ireland from a closed, stagnant economy to one of the most open, dynamic economies in the world. The threat of climate change requires another transformation from a carbon intensive economy to a low or zero carbon activity. Climate change has implications for our economy's capital stock, businesses, production processes and practices and household behavior, too much of which currently has a high carbon footprint. I believe this is the first time that the governor has addressed this important issue in a public forum, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And with that, may I invite President O'Hogarty to say a few words, please. Thank you very much, Green Market. I'm Fáil Roy Verfad. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to, first of all, be involved with the Monsignor de Bruin Lecture Series and, and second to introduce Philip Lane. And, and there are connections between the two in, in, in many ways, uh, some of which I mention here. Uh, I, I'm often conscious that as president of a university that we stand on the shoulders of others. And one of those is Monsignor de Bruyne. Uh, and there are many ways in which I think he's, it's a fitting occasion that Philip Lane would be here uh, to speak at this series tonight. One is that Monsignor de Bruyne himself, like Philip, was an academic. Uh, so Philip's background is that, as we know, that he was a professor uh, in Trinity College before joining the central bank as its 11th governor. And Monsignor de Bruyne similarly was an academic here. Uh, but similarly, they. Uh, de Bruyne was, was a mathematician by background, but I've come to understand he was also uh, something of a polymath in that he was not only uh, his background as professor of mathematics, but he was also a linguist. Uh, Rina Neil, who's our IRC scholar here, is doing work on uh, the links between French and Irish poetry in the post-war period and has found translations by de Bruyne uh, of those uh, from French to Irish. Uh, and so therefore he was also an internationalist particularly in the post-war period. He was president here from 1945 to 59. And obviously that was a period of, of great change, both in Galway, but in Europe more generally, and de Bruyne uh, was conscious of that as well. And that's the second reason I think this is an important uh, connection, if you like, between both Philip and uh, my predecessor, Monsignor de Bruyne, and that this is an international topic. It's one that has its resonances not only as the post-war period did in Galway, uh, but now has resonances beyond our shores. And climate change is obviously something that's very significant, not only uh, and specifically in Galway, but more generally. And I think it's a particularly uh, important topic for us uh, in the context of, of a changing world. And the Whitaker Institute, as Alan has mentioned, is particularly fitting also in the context of the work that's being done there, not only interdisciplinary work, but work on the problems of the day. And there is no more serious or uh, aggravating problem uh, today than climate change. And so addressing this today, I think, is particularly fitting in the context of both Philip's background uh, and Monsignor de Bruyne's background. 
Uh, and that brings me to th the third reason why it's particularly fitting uh, that Philip uh, comes here today is the connection between climate change and the financial system. It's not something that we, we generally uh, think about in, in daily discourse, but it's something particularly significant in the context of how we might incentivize changes in behavior, uh, the importance of uh, financial instruments, financial systems more generally in, in rebalancing, if you like, some of the costs uh, and benefits in society. So there is that connection across uh, two disciplines, at least two disciplines, in the context of the financial system more generally, and then environmental science uh, more specifically in this context. And similarly, De Bruyne was one of those uh, people who looked across disciplines, mathematician by background, linguist by interest, uh, president by career. Uh, and I think uh, it, it pretty much maps uh, very much that sense of interdisciplinarity that the Whitaker Institute also uh, encompasses and that is encapsulated in, in today's uh, address by, by Philip Lane. Uh, and finally, I'd say that you know, one of the things I think is particularly important in this context uh, is that, that, that sense of interconnection that between disciplines. And I think uh, particularly pleased that our research institutes capture that, that in Galway, we, there are areas in which we are, we are interested. Uh, I've often said that location, location, location is particularly important to us. And in that context, uh, we are on the edge of Europe. We have a facility in Mace Head that measures climate change, that measures dirty air going out and clean air coming in. Uh, we, every day, as we wake up, see the horizon. And when we see the horizon, we wonder what's over the other side. And in the case of climate change, it, this is a particular topic, I think, that is interesting in all of those contexts. But secondly, in the case of climate change, one where we understand the, uh, the connectedness and the externalities associated with climate change that is not only an issue for one discipline, but for many. And for that reason today, I'm very pleased to welcome Philip Lane, uh, bringing with him the, the expertise he has. Uh, the final connection between himself and Monsignor de Brunda is that both are academics, and particularly pleased therefore that uh, he's no doubt used to speaking in, in a public forum, but also that this is the forum in which Philip has chosen to speak about this particular area first. Uh, and we see ourselves as a safe place for new ideas, uh, new departures, uh, and similarly here, and we will have new ideas and new departures from Philip and particularly pleased, therefore, to welcome him also for that reason. So you haven't come necessarily to listen to me in your Honish of Kunaisa Aisha Glumsa, Atla Aishla Faratha, a Takdama Yig. so I'll introduce you to Philip Lane, the Governor of the Central Bank. Good morning, Margaret. Good afternoon. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be in a university setting once again. Um, that really, I think, uh, for this topic especially, is important uh, for the same reasons as the President uh, mentioned, uh, to, to uh, talk about this uh, to a wide range of disciplines. I I'm presume uh, here today, uh, given the, the generality of climate change, uh, there's a range of different types of people who uh, decide to come along this evening. Let me say also uh, that essentially when I received the invitation uh, to come here, uh, I think just for the second time uh, since I became governor, it uh, forced me to actually write a paper as opposed to just uh, uh, give a speech. So the, uh, the work behind uh, the, the talk uh, today is uh, probably as we speak, been uploaded to Central Bank website. So it's, been, it's in the format we call it an economic letter which is really uh, has a lot of the academic uh, background uh, to this topic. So if you want to learn more uh, about this topic, you can uh, at the very least look at the footnotes and the citations in my, in my paper. Uh, let me say also that the, uh, as also indicated by the, by the President, in fact, uh, this particular lecture um, is for the same sorts of reasons uh, as was indicated, it's particularly appropriate. So in my own uh, research on Monsignor de Bruyne, uh, indeed, the fact that he was a mathematician, there is a lot of technical material, uh, if you go looking for it, in terms of understanding how the world is being affected by climate change, and equally in terms of modeling the impact on the financial system, the wider economy. Uh, but it's also true that uh, Monsignor de Bruyne, as was mentioned, uh, was uh, an internationalist. In fact, I, uh, I went looking and he spoke uh, Greek, Latin, Italian, French, German, as well as Irish and English. So that really shows, and again, being here the present in, during that time, 
the commitment to internationalism is absolutely part of uh, the, the agenda with climate change. So what I'm going to do is uh, try and convey to you the range of issues we, we face um, uh, in terms of the financial system and in terms of the central bank. Now, I'm sure all of you have spent uh, many weeks and hours of your life studying the central bank's mission statement. Uh, but just uh, as a reminder, uh, why, are we, why do we exist? Why are we here? Uh, our mission statement says uh, we're here, we're obviously it's a state organization, um, and we're there to serve the public interest. And how do we do that? Uh, by uh, working hard to safeguard stability, uh, monitoring financial stability, and by working to ensure that the financial system delivers uh, for consumers and for the wider economy. So this is essentially the context for why we uh, are looking at climate change, because uh, as I hope to show now in a few minutes, uh, all sorts of economic sectors uh, will be deeply affected by climate change. And uh, th this in turn will mean that the financial system has a lot of work to do uh, in terms of supporting the transition to a low carbon economy, uh, to avoid the risks that might be associated with that, and to assist uh, households and firms uh, to finance the transition. There's going to be a lot of uh, expenditure to, uh, in associated with changing how we consume energy, how we produce, how we live, uh, and uh, the transportation sector, for example. So this is a absolutely a very important uh, piece of work for us. By the way, behind all of this, it's very interesting, and, uh, uh, and again, sometimes I make the mistake of going on Twitter or other social media, and there's all sorts of interesting series about why central banks uh, operate and how they make decisions. But we, uh, like I think every other central bank, will be crystal clear. In fact, uh, we're really uh, grounded in the Constitution, where, again, uh, f for those of you who've got your uh, copy of the Constitution in front of you, uh, Article 45.2 says that the, the, con the Constitution of this country is that the control of credit should be directed for the general welfare of the population. So again, we're not here to uh, maximize the shareholder value of banks. We're not here to uh, support the financial industry. It's the financial industry is there to support the wider population. And this is one of those uh, key areas for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, what's interesting is in some countries, uh, what we do is split across different agencies. So, uh, whereas we would be an integrated organization, as part of the euro system, uh, through the ECB and the wider network of national central banks, we have a common currency. So how we think about monetary policy, which I'll come back to, is going to be in that context of the ECB. But in fact, and especially since the crisis, there's an increasing realization that national central banks have a particular responsibility for domestic financial stability. We've had the crisis here 10 years ago, uh, but now, in fact, part of the post-crisis reform has been to make sure that the central bank has the lead responsibility. Uh, whether this is what we call macroprudential policy, such as uh, the famous mortgage rules, uh, how we set capital buffers for the banks and so on. The uh, resolution authority is, if we choose to shut down a bank, how do we do that without causing ripple effects? So a lot of work now is to make sure next time uh, we have to shut down a bank, we can do it without knocking on the door of the taxpayer. By the way, we do this you know, every so often with some credit unions, so it's not the case, it's just a hypothetical for the future. We have done this uh, for the credit union sector. Uh, liquidity policy, uh, again, in a situation where there's a temporary problem, uh, provide liquidity, and crisis management. We, we spend a lot of time now preparing for, we don't know what the next crisis is going to be, Hopefully, uh, it'll be many years from now, but we have to be ready uh, for that. We're also the prudential regulator. What does that mean? It means keeping individual firms uh, safe. Uh, so they, do they have enough capital to take losses? Uh, do they have enough liquidity to ride out temporary shocks? Um, and we do that for banks. Uh, we do that for insurance companies. We do that for investment firms. By the way, this is uh, not just the local firms you're familiar with. We're also the uh, host for a lot of global firms. There's a lot of firms operate out of Ireland where their customers are elsewhere. So it may not be visible on the street, but we as the Prudential Regulator are looking to see are they financially safe. 
the conduct regulator means um, making sure that the users of the financial system are properly treated. So whether that's retail customers, whether it's investors, whether it's participants in the financial markets. And again, I've tried uh, to avoid the B word, but I'm gonna have to use the B word now, Brexit, is uh, after Brexit now, we have much more market activity out of Dublin because some of the city of London activity is now in Dublin. And this is essentially global uh, financial markets, derivative markets and so on, where th there is a scope for market manipulation and so on. So we have to be involved in that. Uh, in our legal mandate, we also uh, have the mandate to provide economic analysis and advice. So that's more general. So if we say, if we look at, see a problem, it could be beyond the monetary sphere, but we might do research. We have a large pool of uh, researchers in the central bank and uh, this is uh, more general than just what we do. And then what's interesting is the assessment of climate change is there's a lot going on. Uh, there's lots of pockets of activity across many different areas of policy. Uh, many people will have a little bit of climate change in, in what they do, uh, but the system as a whole, especially here in Ireland, is not doing enough. So when you have big institutions like the central bank, which have a lot of influence, having the leadership role to make sure that the financial system is uh, doing more, doing more quickly, is part of uh, what, what we should be doing. So uh, when you come to it, so well, tell me why, why is you as a central bank uh, so focused on climate change? And there's really two uh, ways to think about it. One is uh, increasing frequency of, of bad weather. Uh, and these are economically uh, important. So at the ECB, when we look at monetary policy, we're trying to diagnose what's going on in the European economy. Uh, more and more you'll see our reports saying, well, it was a particularly severe winter or it was a particularly hot summer. And this is why the data looks a bit strange. So there are more and more the quarter by quarter volatility in the economy is driven by weather. So that's pretty uh, basic uh, consequence of climate change is weather matters quite a bit. Whether that's for sudden floods or you know, hot or cold spells, or more fundamentally, if it makes some types of activity non-viable. Uh, so for example, if certain coastal areas no longer become viable, uh, it could be uh, certain regions of the world, big migration flows because they're no longer viable. Um, so there's all sorts of, uh, also in terms of the correct uh, types of uh, uh, crops and so on to, to, to produce. So that's one element. And, and then the second element is it's crystal clear and it's global policy through the Paris Agreement um, that we need to have this carbon transition where the policy targets are to move uh, relative 1990 values to a 40% reduction in uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 and be carbon neutral by 2050. To get there, that's a big transition. And uh, typically, if you model that, it's going to be okay if it's steady and gradual work. If you want to get there, start already and be steady and gradual, and it's going to be doable. If you leave it too late, then if you leave it too late, you do a lot very quickly, and that will be very disruptive. Very disruptive equals recession, big changes in financial markets, bankruptcies, losses, and so on. It's also possible to think about going too quickly, uh, which is um, maybe partly famously uh, investor and consumer psychology. So if, let's say if you imagine a world where everyone says uh, the uh, era of the petrol engine is over. I'm not gonna buy a diesel car, I'm not gonna buy a petrol car, I'm only gonna buy an electric car. If the world decides to do that in the next year, the capacity of electric car producers is not there yet. So you would have this big decline in spending, but in fact, you cannot make the transition in uh, one year or two years. So you need to have a kind of a uh, middle ground, uh, kind of Goldilocks, not too fast, not too slow. Um, so this is why you can have uh, this issue of managing to transition is going to be, uh, the, my base case, my main case is it should be okay, uh, but either too fast or too slow can be disruptive. And as a central bank, we care about details. 
where kind of the uh, bad events happen. And this is why we're, we're focused on this. Because uh, this is uh, every sector, every time uh, will be affected, this is why the financial system is going to be central to all of this. Because the financial system interacts with everyone. It in interacts with households, it um, interacts with every industry, uh, it interacts with governments. Uh, and this is why the financial system is kind of a, and a very important uh, element of the, of the whole uh, issue about how climate change will, will uh, operate. So as I said already, uh, the targets are 40% by 10 years from now, 11 years from now, and then neutrality by 2050. Already, you might say, well, when is climate change going to happen? It's been happening for decades already. Uh, when I did my PhD in the early 90s, there was a lot of people working on climate change. Uh, those guys are still working away. If you look at the financial sector, one way to think about it is insurance. Uh, in kind of uh, inflation-adjusted terms, uh, there's been a, a factor of five increase in insurance payouts on weather-related events. Or damage, I should say. This is damage, whether it's insured or uninsured. Big question is, uh, what will be premium in the future? Or maybe there'll be just uh, non-availability. Maybe many types of risks will not be uh, available uh, for insurance because it's just it's no longer a risk, it's a certainty, and uh, that's not insurable. The reason why I say uh, a reasonable speed of transition is doable is you might say one trillion a year nearly in investment is a lot. Fine, it is a lot, but it's less than 1% of world GDP. So spending less than 1% of world GDP for the next 40 years or 30 years is totally doable. You just have to have, to have the collective will the coordination to get it done. So this is why, I mean, uh, I think always it's the most important challenge we face. Absolutely it is. But this should not be converted into an idea that this is some really high barrier. It is something that's totally doable, but it, it involves a uh, real commitment and real resources. So uh, how do we get the carbon transition going? How does that, you know, because people don't listen to lectures. Uh, well, some people do, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, beyond just exhorting people on a moral case of, you know, please be more carbon neutral, the, the kind of stick here is going to be a big increase in carbon taxes. So here in Ireland, the Climate Change Advisory Council is advising going from the current rate of 20 euro per ton to 80 euro per ton over a decade. So if you did that in one year, it'd be disruptive. I'll come back to later on. But in a phased way, uh, that will, you will notice that. You will notice that in terms of uh, transportation. You will notice that in terms of heating your car. You, uh, the university is going to notice that in heating this uh, campus. So that's going to need a lot of adjustment. Um, and then, as I said earlier on, uh, a lot of work has been done. Uh, the EPA's assessment from a few months ago is the framework is there in Ireland. We have a lot of laws passed, we have a lot of science done, but it remains the case there isn't that system-wide push to actually implement. People are still on defense, there's not have people moving forward, even though the legal barriers, the policy barriers uh, are no longer there. <laughs> so and I, I, I'll turn Al Gore for a, little, a minute or two and uh, say, well, if you go to the internet, you can find all sorts of great graphs. So the... Uh, Baseline here is 1951 to 1980. Uh, so there's two views of this. One is, if you go back to 100 years ago, cooler than that mid-century profile. And if you go to uh, 2017, hotter. So this idea that um, global warming is happening, it's really hard to disagree with. Again, it's not the case of today's weather, as, pres you know, as uh, some people would look at, uh, but it's more the, the uh, if you take a 30-year average, then you can sort of look at it. Um, equally, you've got a one percentage point uh, increase in uh, average temperatures relative to that baseline uh, at a global level. And it, it, this is a meta Aaron data. You can see the incidence of above average versus below average uh, years. <laughs> Uh, just the increasing frequency of above average years in the, re the recent 30 years has really gone up a lot. So, you know, I'm not going to spend time about it. Is climate change happening? Um, you know, I think it, it, uh, if you look at the, the data there, I think we just pulled this from the MetAaron website. So we've got 
uh, political events in there as well. And what's interesting is, even under these scenarios, there's still going to be a lot of global warming. So what we have here is the orange line is saying this is the trend in global warming. And if there's no policy changes, we're going to go above this threshold of one and a half degrees uh, Celsius uh, before 2040. So that's the dotted uh, orange line. Under the kind of a uh, base scenario, the, the um, the base scenario is the middle line. Uh, we, we have that distribution there. It's quite a lot of uncertainty, uh, which is the basis of the scenario reaching neutrality by 2055. And you might, if you're lucky, keep temperatures below uh, or near to 1.5, but more likely it's going to be well above that, if not quite to 2 degrees. So uh, the, this idea of carbon neutrality by 2055 is uh, still going to lead to a lot of global warming. Whereas if we get to carbon neutral by 2040, uh, we're more likely to hit that uh, 1.5 degree um, target. So a lot of the UN work now is, let's see what we can do to get to one point, limited to 1.5. And if you just see in terms of uh, the flow and stock of emissions, uh, what you can see now is the annual rate of emissions is around 35 uh, billion tons a year. To go from 35 billion to zero, you can imagine we'll need a lot of transition. Whether you do it by 2055 or you do it more quickly will make a big difference because what matters for global warming is the accumulated stock, and that's the difference about different speeds of adjustment. And uh, then, in terms of carbon pricing, you might say, well, uh, how are we going to get to 80 euros a ton by 2030? But in fact, let me emphasize is other countries have already moved beyond that. So you can look around, these countries are still fine, they're still prosperous. It is not the case that you, it's a survival threat to the economic system. When you have Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, uh, now coverage ratios differ, but more or less the idea that, uh, that this is um, infeasible or not worth talking about uh, is not there. Okay, so what I want to do is just uh, go through how do we think about it when you break down the adjustment to individual sectors. Um, now, it's also the case you have to bring all the sectors together into a macro view, which I'll do later on. But let me just go through some individual sectors. Because a lot of attention is on energy produ production. Because clearly a lot of our carbon emissions right now is, for example, in certain parts of the world including here in Europe, uh, a lot of energy production is using coal, which is extremely uh, carbon uh, intensive. So it, I think the point here for Ireland is, of course, there's a lot of work to be done here, but this is, in a comparative sense, not the worst country in terms of the challenge here. We're not a big, heavy user of coal and oil in how we produce electricity, and that's going to be even more true when we shut down Money Point in 2025. Uh, there's an open question remain about how quickly will peat be discontinued as an input into production. So I'm not going to spend time on this because it's, uh, renewables here look like a success story, uh, that it's possible, given the uh, wind and all of that, uh, to have a high ratio of renewables in energy production. So let's come to uh, where everyone here is going to feel it at some point, is uh, households. So how are households going to adapt, ad adapt to much more expensive energy? Uh, and there's uh, one basic point is uh, there's about, I think about 2 million uh, homes in Ireland which will need retrofitting. And uh, I think current cost of complete retrofitting is around 35,000 euro a house. So all of you are going to have to build up a rainy day fund or take out a home loan to pay for that, whether you're doing it now or doing it sometime over the next uh, 30 years. This will be everyone in the country will have to spend money uh, to retrofit their homes. And uh, that's money you can't spend on something else. So that's a big financial uh, choice. Well, you know, you're not going to have that much choice because energy will be so expensive. Is what is the optimal time to do it? because the construction industry cannot do everyone in the same year. So this is one reason why having a gradual path for carbon uh, taxes is important, because uh, if you went from 20 to 80 overnight, uh, 
you know, lots of people be scrambling. And we have a construction sector which is still supposed to be building homes and building hospitals, uh, new buildings for universities and so on, is how do you manage that effort? So that's pretty basic and it's pretty universal that when you uh, raise the price of energy, uh, this uh, uh, imperative to retrofit uh, homes is going to be there. I noticed, I think, at the Whitaker Institute last week, the week before, someone was looking at flooding and house values. Uh, the volatility of house prices will go up, uh, depending on where your home is, uh, how far away you are from uh, flood-prone uh, seas and rivers and so on, other environmental factors. So the, you know, you thought you had a nice investment there, maybe you don't. So the issue about uh, your house as a financial asset is going to come into play. For transportation, uh, how quickly we should uh, switch from uh, oil fueled cars to electric. We can't all do it in the same year for the same basic reason, is the amount of electric cars uh, is just not, they're not in ready scale availability. I think over five years, I'm told it'll get there, but not over one year. And by the way, uh, in, in the paper, um, uh, we, we're noting that the uh, amount of electric cars sold this month or in January 19 was 800 and something uh, compared to 100 and something a year ago. So there is actually, there's a switch going on now. That's about two and a half percent of total cars bought in, tw in January 2019. So it's moving, but it's still pretty small. Um, and then, uh, you know, your, uh, many people will now these days won't have a guaranteed pension. They'll have what's called a defined contribution pension where you're putting money into some uh, pension fund, which is investing in the markets. And therefore you're exposed uh, if there's market disruption. If your fund uh, holds oil shares, uh, shares in, car, in, electric, in petrol car manufacturers, uh, in all sorts of sectors which may lose from the carbon transition. So you have a lot of risk uh, through that as well. And, and then as I'll come to later on, uh, the chances of Achieving this carbon transition without a macro recession uh, is open to debate. Uh, and so macro recession is associated with unemployment, uh, uh, bad debt, uh, lots of uh, negativity. So uh, you're all uh, going to be exposed and you should be worried. Uh, and we, on your behalf, are trying to do what we can or will be trying to do what we can. Uh, similar agenda for firms. Uh, and more to do. So firms equally will have to retrofit offices, uh, retail outlets, commercial properties. Availability of commercial insurance in terms of price of coverage will change. Uh, firms which offer defined benefit pensions, so they promised a payout to their uh, staff, uh, will have to cover that if there's market uh, disruption. Uh, firms face the issue about as we move production from high carbon to low carbon techniques, who wins, who loses? Is it going to be existing firms who switch production or will new entrants take the market? And so you could have, uh, you know, economically, uh, it could go either way. It could go either way in different sectors. Um, and also you have this issue of switching preferences. So if you've made a big bet, say, on, on hybrid cars, um, and in, but in fact, um, in the end, technology means they are put to one side and all electric moves in more quickly. Uh, those firms are, could be in trouble. Now, for us, we don't have a big uh, uh, car produ producing industry in Ireland. We are not as exposed as, say, Germany or countries with big oil sectors and so on. So here we are less exposed in some countries on some of these issues. The construction sector um, is a good news, bad news story. Uh, construction itself uh, can be very carbon intensive. So the switch to low carbon uh, materials is going to be important. On the other hand, they have this new business line of retrofitting. It's going to be a big uh, extra line of business for construction, but in turn, they need the skill sets, they need the scale technologies to do that. And then agriculture, uh, it's, it's a mixed story. Uh, we uh, all are aware of uh, certain types of emissions from the agricultural sector. Uh, on the other hand, uh, biomass fuel and afforestation can be some of the mitigants to climate change. So I don't attempt here to get into that, but you can see here, depending on the sector you look at, uh, depending on the firm you're looking at, uh, who wins, who loses, the investments required is all going to need financing. 
It's going to need debt financing and equity financing for startups and so on. So again, the financial system is going to have to work out who are good risks, who are bad risks. How do I work out the carbon exposure of given firms and so on? It's a big uh, challenge. <laughs> the public sector, again, I'll come back to the retrofitting. Imagine, we know all of the, the kind of uh, uh, buildings, school buildings, hospital buildings, other uh, offices, which are not exactly at the high end of the energy rating. So uh, the retrofitting of the public uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then there's financial issues here now is, how much will the government support the switch to low carbon? Right now, there are uh, incentives for retrofitting, but if everyone took up those incentives, it'd be pretty expensive. So, and also you want to respect the polluter pays principle about who should bear the burden of some of this. Uh, there's also going to be a global issue here, which is international transfers, either for climate justice reasons, given that the advanced economies have done most of the emitting, uh, that there's a moral case to do transfers to the developing world, who've done less and who have a bigger challenge ahead of them. Uh, and also even uh, in terms of this issue about the connection migration. If uh, areas of the world which get too wet or too dry uh, lead big migration outflows, that's going to be uh, require a lot of international um, aid. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some of the uh, financial numbers here. Um, let me talk about uh, what our role is. So one basic issue is climate change uh, is going to play out over decades. So if you're running a financial firm where you're focused on the next quarter or the next year, how do you manage that, uh, in Mark Carney's phrase, the tragedy of, of the horizon? Is that there is a temptation to put this on, we will do it, we'll have a glossy section of our website, but we're not going to do it this year, or not much this year. Let's delay. So um, that is one of our roles as kind of a, the public entity here, where we're trying to see, well, what, how can the financial system serve the public good? Is that a, a push from us uh, to put this higher up the strategy uh, priorities will be important. I've mentioned monetary policy already with the volatility. It does change uh, how we think about monetary policy. Uh, but I, I'm conscious of time, so I want to skip over that as well. Let me talk about the issue about will this be severe enough to cause uh, macro recessions and financial stability risks? And I've already mentioned uh, this can come from a severe weather event. It can come from a transition that's too fast or too slow. It can come from a technological breakthrough. So let's imagine there are now currently technological limits to uh, renewables in energy, for example, the difficulty of storing renewable energy. But if some of those uh, problems are solved, maybe by some of the scientists in the room, uh, then you could have a really uh, very rapid set of bankruptcies of firms reliant on current technologies. So great news for the world, technological breakthrough, but there will be uh, financial losers from that. And then also, as I mentioned, this could all be uh, lead to uh, expectational shifts among investors and consumers. So as I already mentioned, if everyone decided overnight, uh, and to be honest, you know, I sometimes have to talk to myself is, should I ever buy a car again? Because it's going to be such a money loser at some point. Is uh, given the car industry employs a lot of people globally, uh, what would happen in that scenario? Let me mention also is the financial system. It's not just about what's happening in one country. It's global because uh, the, global, the financial system is global in many ways. Many firms have international exposures. And so it's not just climate change here, it's, it's a, at a global level. So I want to say, uh, it's, in thinking about would this cause uh, financial problems, uh, let me uh, give the example of a study by the Dutch National Bank, where uh, this shows what can be done. So they collected the data from the firms they regulate, banks, insurance companies, pension funds. They also looked at the corporate loans of banks. And then they asked, well, what happens, because a lot of these climate risks will be global in nature, what happens if we have some global shocks here? Let's work out the macro implication. What, let's work out the implication for at an industry level. So they have uh, physical data on uh, carbon use at an industry level. And then the taking into account, if, there, if there's a recession, there will also be changes in interest rates. 
<laughs> and uh, let me uh, say here is that you could have big losses here. So they look at four shocks. The policy shock is, let's imagine uh, this pressure, uh, this populist pressure, so let's say, to go to uh, a carbon tax of $100 immediately. So I just said this would be quite disruptive if you go from 20 to 100 in one go. But let's say uh, the world delivered that. There was a global move to $100 uh, uh, per ton of carbon. Uh, that's the policy shock. There's a policy decision to do that. There are other policy decisions uh, going on now. I say courts. And there's a court case here in Ireland now where there's campaigners saying the government is not doing enough to meet its carbon targets. In Germany, various judges have made decisions about banning diesel or old generation diesel from various cities because of the environmental impact. So policy is not just made by governments, it's de facto made by court decisions and other mechanisms as well. The technology shock is a breakthrough in renewables, which is great, except it destroys value among existing firms, which we have to recognize. The double shock when both of those happen at the same time. And then the confidence shock is, as I say, if there's a decline in consumption and investment because people don't know, what can I buy that's carbon safe? If I buy anything, it's going to be destroyed in value by the transition. And so uh, whether it's banks, insurance companies, pension funds, the way I'd interpret this here is these are significant but not existential. So losing 10% of the value of your assets under pretty strong shocks here is you're going to notice that, but it's not something that's going to be too catastrophic. And so one way to think about that is uh, when we look at uh, the CT1 ratio is the capital ratio of a bank. How much have they set aside to absorb losses? These shocks are leading to three or four percentage point losses. Uh, when you have capital ratios around 16%, which is also true here, it remains the case these banks are nowhere near uh, entering survival issues. Um, what it does mean as regulators, we will want to keep those ratios high enough that they can take these losses. So one of these, the reason why we look at these scenarios is saying, you know, we have to have a fat margin here. The banks, the insurance companies have to be, have fat enough buffers that they can take this kind of reasonable uh, losses. And, but I think the other message here is, these are not uh, going back to, because sometimes people get too pessimistic about climate change, saying it's so awful, you know, I want to close my ears and not think about it. These are significant, but with a bit of planning and effort, uh, they can be handled. Okay, so in terms of uh, at a macro level, we think it's, it can be managed. Uh, if you uh, are entering into uh, a pension plan with an individual firm, uh, if you want to buy a kind of mutual fund or even put money in deposit, you want to be sure that the firm you deal with is also reasonably safe. So we do. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of individual firms. Uh, so some of the issues here is have they got climate in their strategy? How are they making decisions about making sure they're climate robust? Uh, are they putting enough attention to these long-term risks in, in, in uh, designing their, their uh, systems? Are they telling people what they should tell? So if you read the financial press now, there's this concept of ESG. Uh, you can buy a mutual fund which is environmentally friendly, uh, friendly to sustainable finance, and is well-governed. So that's a label that is increasingly popular. Uh, we kind of want to know what that means. Because uh, the temptation is you put the label on something uh, and unless there's kind of some regulatory standard, it could be misleading. So this issue of disclosure is very important. Are the firms operating the economy uh, disclosing their carbon usage? And are the investment firms, the banks, the insurers, telling you, the customer, what you, you need to know if you want to avoid climate risk. Uh, there's a, a basic issue about taxonomy here. What is green? Um, and then there's also the issue, typically you want to say, well, compared to some benchmark, is this investment doing well? So how do you define a low carbon benchmark? So the European Commission is working on all of this at high speed. Uh, a lot of this is going on at the moment. And there's going to be an issue about, as regulators, are we going to tell banks, we think that 
industry is uh, too carbon risky and we, we're going to insist you put more reserves against that type of loan. Uh, so that's either you say it, saying we're going to favour green firms or we're going to penalise brand dirty firms, brand firms. Right now, we don't have the information to do that. Uh, and this is uh, one of the open questions here. So this is something that globally is going on uh, by us and by many other central banks, uh, looking at all of these issues. There's a network for greening the financial system, bringing together central banks around the world. Um, and let me also, just in the last minute or two before I open for up, uh, uh, stop, because again, you can read the more details in, in the paper on our website, is we are also, in terms of our own behavior, trying to be uh, carbon compliant. So in our investment portfolio, we follow ESG guidelines for our, our equity portfolio. Something similar for bonds is, is uh, on, in the works. Uh, we buy a lot of green bonds. So uh, 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 that, that's an uh, important part of what we do now. Um, including, by the way, the green sovereign bond that Ireland issued. Ireland has a, now a big uh, sovereign issue of green bonds uh, last October. Our new building is high, uh, ra highly rated, um, and there's a lot of interest in... We have a really large new building, and the kind of engineering of that to be so well rated is important. I will make the obvious comment is that I go to a lot of international meetings, um, and uh, how, how is that consistent with a low carbon footprint? I think the, uh, we, we all have to work uh, on uh, how much we can substitute those meetings for teleconferencing and so on. So from our point of view, within the central bank, this is going to cut across everything we do because it's so wide, it's so general, it's so important. Uh, but maybe I'll just stop there, which is by saying uh, the idea of climate resilience, making the financial system, making the economy resilient so that even if the carbon transition goes badly, it won't be multiplied by a financial crisis. That's our contribution here. Also, our contribution concerning consumer protection, that if you buy something you think is green, that it will be green. Uh, and that also this issue about uh, when you have to save up to pay for your electric car uh, and to pay for your um, uh, energy refit of your home, uh, that the banks will have products available to you in terms of financing that. Um, so I, I do think uh, uh, this is all, you know, we're all going to go through this over many years. And just coming back to the basic point here is that as a central bank, we are a large institution. We have a leadership role in the financial system. And this is why uh, through this talk today and through other measures, we are intent on, on you know, raising the awareness levels of this issue. So let me stop there. Um, Gavin Elaine, it has been a great privilege to uh, listen to your first public lecture on climate change and the financial system. And I, I really hope that you enjoyed writing this paper and that you enjoyed giving it giving um, its first public outing here um, at NUIG. Um, climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we face as society and um, in, in this context obviously we all have a role to play in tackling it but also then obviously it is a systemic issue so it's very interesting and intriguing to hear more about um, I suppose the central bank's role within that and the, the, the interconnectedness with, with the financial um, system and you have given us I think a lot of food for thought on, on how that interconnectedness uh, works. You've spoken a lot about um, maybe the exposure of various sectors in Ireland, um, how it impacts individuals, firms, markets. So I, I think uh, given the interdisciplinary um, nature of our audience, I think there are yeah, it's something that there is something for uh, every one of us, I think, in the audience to reflect upon. We have now about uh, 15 minutes for your questions. Uh, what I would like to invite, uh, what I would like to do is now, yeah, invite Governor Lane back up um, to take questions. And we may take um, two or three questions in, uh, in one go. Um, and we have microphones to, um, to pass around. So if you could please uh, raise your hands if you have a question. One question here, yeah. Uh, Shane Mooney's my name. Thank you for your talk. Um, the 
credit unions, um, their losses is, are very low in, in consideration with the banks. Is their asset base and their billions that are on deposit in restricted or, I suppose, low margin investments, is their asset base a huge opportunity to invest into renewables and into retrofit and stuff like that um, to give us all, I suppose, the scope and the money? I think that they have a huge um, a, something to add to the economy and to make us pro progressive rather than laggards in the European context. Yeah, I, I can take that while, while, just while the next question's being lined up. So the uh, credit union movement, uh, we have a special role uh, in regulating the credit unions because they're so important uh, in the economy, especially um, at a community level. As you mentioned, uh, what's happening now is uh, they have a lot of deposits uh, and they're making uh, relatively few loans compared to that. So a lot of money is resting in the Irish banking system. Now, it's not doing nothing because, in turn, the banks will use those deposits for other types of lending. So even, uh, even if the, it didn't end up with new lending opportunities for credit unions, the, the money collected by the credit unions, that, that is, in turn, a big part of the funding of the banks, is important. But I would say, I mean, I think it's an interesting area that, um, and this is where, you know, we would, I mean, I think it's only starting now, is, what is the correct duration of a home renovation loan? Because typically, uh, credit unions might be better suited to loans uh, below a certain value and maybe that are not that long in duration compared to a mortgage and so on. Uh, so it's inter you know, I think we would have an open mind. Um, I think it's, it's a, a, an interesting issue, but at this point, whether these loans are better delivered by credit unions or by commercial banks or other entities, let's see. <coughs> Hello. Hi. Um, thanks very much for your lecture. It's great to see, um, you know, finance, um, the, somebody like yourself coming into this particular area because I think it's very important. Um, just my question is, you know, in, in terms of use, using economics as a way of um, potentially solving this problem, is there not a danger that in countries like Ireland um, that we simply be exporting the problems, you know, that we'll be, we'd be reducing the green um, you know, the, the amount of harmful emissions here, but exporting it to countries like China, for example. Yeah, so that has to be recognised that, you know, the advanced countries, now, not here, because emissions are still going up here, but to the extent the advanced countries can say, well, we're doing a better job than, say, China, is a fake comparison, because if you move your manufacturing to China, that's where the emissions will be. So, and, it, you know, the... Uh, climate doesn't care who's emitting, it's the global number that matters. So I did mention in terms of the public finance challenge, uh, it's going to be important about how much, the, and this is why, as you know, in the UN uh, negotiations, it's always a big battle about how much financing will the advanced economies, including us, uh, give to the developing world, uh, which are on the front line, uh, and which did not do the original emitting in the first place. So absolutely, we have to think about it in a, in a, in a global level, um, but we can't be free riders either. So it's absolutely true, uh, the emissions out of Ireland will not make much of a difference to the global number. We're too small to affect the global number, but this is where we all have to kind of move together, and this is why the UN is so important here. You have to have com common targets. Uh, in Europe, that's been converted into the EU targets from uh, the UN to the European Union. And it's, it's an act of solidarity. It's an act of uh, joint uh, responsibility for the planet. Uh, if, you know, the, the, the kind of um, idea that uh, in either direction, we should, we should focus on what's happening here. What's happening here is we can control it, um, but it's, it should be understood in a global context. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dear Mulcahy is my name. I'm the Chairman of the Council for the West. Uh, very interested in your talk, and you mentioned that the central bank could look at perhaps advising certain industries that banks might focus on or not. I think that's the kind of the general thing of what you were saying. I'm just interested in what view you'd have around the agri-food sector, given that 
rural in the west of Ireland is obviously dependent to a large extent on that. I know we have important manufacturing also, but in terms of, say, methane and emissions and stuff like that, possibly coming from farming or agri-food, the wish that the Irish agri-food sector wants to increase, which is happening, but what role the central bank might have in terms of how it views financing for that versus the potential for climate change effect, if you want. Do you have any thoughts or comments yeah, on that? Yeah, sure. So I think it's important to say is our role is kind of the risk management issue. So um, if the government more generally made a decision that they wanted to either support or kind of starve an industry through public subsidies, that's essentially one area. We don't do, you know, we're not democratically elected, we're bureaucrats. So we're not going to make kind of value judgments about which industries should be supported, which should not, in terms of value. What we would do, but this is going to be a global decision, is uh, if the assessment is certain industries have now become riskier because they're so exposed to carbon uh, emit usage, then those industries would essentially... Uh, uh, we will be telling the banks globally if you want to lend to that industry you essentially will have to put more aside because we think the risk of the loans going bad has gone up uh, in another industry we think well that's we our assessment is this is a low carbon industry uh, the carbon risk is not so high therefore you can uh, basically lend more cheaply to that sector so it's going to be a global technical decision and as you say, agri-food is interesting because there's the issue about globally versus within the industry, where is the kind of a, a more efficient places to produce? And obviously, all of these things interact with geography. So uh, you're going to have a, one view, which is the sectoral view, another view, which is the geographical view. Um, but I, you know, I do think uh, this is going to be, uh, you know, the science not there yet for this. So this is something where uh, we think uh, globally, central banks, it's a, it's a waiting game. We need the disclosure, disclosure of information. We need the taxonomy. We need more information than we currently have to make a big call on this. Um, but it's, I think it's coming down the tracks. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for very... My name is Fiona Lapp. Um, one pertaining to corporate social responsibility on companies like ourselves produce in order to um, enhance their, their, their So it's good that corporations have a corporate social responsibility strategies. And we, we also have our own at the central bank. Um, but let me uh, not dwell on that because, it's, of course, it's good uh, and it's important uh, to, to do it well. But it's secondary. I mean, the, the primary issue is going to be how the world operates. So uh, for insurance companies, I'm sure MetLife and many other firms are doing a lot of data analysis, working out the changing nature of the risks they face uh, or the world faces. Um, so this is essentially, it, if you like, it has to move from CSR bucket of let's give something back, let's do something for the global climate versus how are we going to uh, do our main activity, our main line of business? Because you cannot, you know, that has to be done. We cannot substitute saying, well, we're going to continue as, as usual in our main line of business, and then we're going to buy some carbon offsets, or we're going to sponsor you know, some uh, retrofitting of social housing or something. That's all good, but it's kind of, to me, it's a secondary issue compared to the primary issue of um, uh, just facing this challenge. It's interesting, uh, this issue about individuals, um, because, of course, every individual... Uh, we'll have to do quite a bit. Uh, and of course, it's good, as I said earlier on, to exhort to people, uh, and uh, you know, uh, in terms of 
uh, day by day, the recycling issue, the, do you really need to print out, uh, I'm, you know, in the central bank, for example, we're anti-paper. So saying, you know, I, I kind of give out to people bring printouts. To, I did bring a printout of my slides, but more or less, uh, if people are print, printing things out rather than looking at it on their screen, it's, it's a bit of a no-no. Uh, it's not right, I have someone from the central bank here, so she'll agree with me. But the, um, so all of that is true, but essentially uh, the really only, you can't rely on that. What's gonna happen is this big emphasis on, uh, in the, primarily on the carbon tax. If you face a gigantic jump in your energy bill, you're going to change your behavior. Uh, not because, even if, if you're the most amoral person going, uh, if it's too expensive, you're going to do less of it. You're going to look for alternatives. And that's the only way to get the system-wide fundamental transition that is needed. Um, so of course, it's down to individuals, but it's not about your uh, moral uh, capacity. It's not about your philosophy of the world it's going to hit your, your pocket. And that's essentially the way to get, to get it done. Thank you. Um, Pauline O'Reilly from the Green Party. Um, thank you very much, Governor Lane. Um, I appreciate you lending us your expertise today. Um, I suppose early, early enough in your presentation, you spoke about how um, policy, policy and legislative changes were in place. Um, and I, I think that most of us would probably feel, and I don't know how you feel about this, but that we've been very conservative as a country in our preparation around climate change. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you mentioned that but people are, are still not moving forward enough despite those legislative and, and policy um, changes. But you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and I'm just wondering, wh what is it that you need in order for you to be able to reach your goal of climate resilience that, that hasn't been given to you, I suppose, from external sources sure. thus far. Thank okay. you. So, so w w what I was trying to say with that statement was, in terms of the legal frameworks, uh, in terms of some of the uh, policy fr frameworks, they, they, a lot of work has been done. But w what that has to convert to, I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about individual policymakers. So whether it's city managers, uh, people running uh, housing departments, uh, uh, all sorts of, there's all sorts of people who uh, uh, maybe they don't know what to do, they don't know how quickly to, to move forward. There's also coordination issues that say, it's point is me moving if the other guy is not moving. So this is a leadership and coordination issue, which uh, is kind of a system-wide imperative. In the financial system, that's our job as a central bank. Um, so we will uh, be doing more on this. Um, and also, because it's a global issue, we're going to be working globally uh, you know, on these issues. Uh, so this is really the uh, conundrum, which is it needs a system-wide push here and elsewhere. Um, but it is, the diagnosis is here. Um, you know, there have been legislative step, steps forward, but the implementation, are we seeing it in how different departments work? Different cities work, uh, different sectors work, not yet. And th that's the gap. Thank you, uh, Pro Professor Lane. Um, my query, um, I'm one of the, the academics here in, in UI Galway, um, so some of the students already know me. Um, but I just wanted to maybe flesh out a very simple question is about the financing of um, any new investment. As you said, it's going to be require huge um, investment. And I suppose my query is that over the next year or so, the, um, in the US, the Green New Deal idea is going to get a lot of publicity and traction already has in terms of using that, uh, in terms of the analogy to try to have um, I suppose ta higher taxes on, on higher incomes uh, as a way to finance new infrastructure in the US. So do you think something analogous to that will happen in the EU? Um, and if so, would it be the case that probably fiscal policy may not be an appropriate mechanism because of the fact of the fiscal treaty? And therefore, is there a role then for the ECB particularly to look at maybe some form of something equivalent or similar to LTROs or TLTROs in, in terms of, of, a, of a monetary financing of this new investment if the fiscal side won't do it? 
and I appreciate that you may not wish to commit on ECB policy quite yet. <laughs> so if you uh, if you uh, click and download, and you know, uh, I care about my click rate. If you download the paper, uh, there are several uh, uh, essays by ECB officials about the role of the ECB. I mean, by the way, because we've been buying so many, so many assets in recent times, we're a very big holder of green bonds. And also green bonds are a very important part of a collateral for people looking for loans from the ECB. So there's a lot going on already. This issue about a preference, that this, you go beyond that and say, well, uh, that, again, it goes back to central banks. We're not, we don't have a democratic mandate. We're, we're delegated on a narrow basis to run monetary policy, uh, to do financial stability work and so on. But I think th this would go back is this is why fiscal, in terms of policy support, fiscal is the natural place because uh, that reflects the democratic preferences of society uh, to have that. Uh, I would emphasize it's not so clear the balance between, because you know picking winners is pretty difficult. Uh, there's a lot of private entrepreneurial effort here um, and so the issue about what is the role of public subsidy versus uh, enabling commercial markets for venture capital, for seed finance, and so on. Um, you know, I think I think because uh, the, the incentives could be elsewhere. I mean, the carbon tax. This goes back to the simplicity of if you have a really strong carbon tax, which is so universal, that in itself is sending a big signal. Stop lending money. Stop injecting equity into carbon intensive firms and industries and it gives a big incentive to the commercial financial system to get into low carbon uh, firms and markets. So I think it's probably, you know, uh, that can go a long way. The simplicity of just saying, listen, the big challenge here is let's, because it's so universal, let's get, let's get that much more stiff than it is now in a gradual way. I think that might do a lot of the work. Okay. So. So um, th thanks a lot, Governor Lane, also for answering uh, all the questions and sharing your insights uh, with us. And I would like to invite Alan to conclude today's lecture. Thank you, Esther, for doing a great job in sharing the, the questions and answers. Um, I, I should mention a few people here. I'm, I'm very grateful to Liz McConnell, the President's Office, and to Angela Sice and Courtney Yanta. Uh, at the Whitaker Institute for all their, their work in making um, this evening's event happen. Um, my thanks to Governor Lane, uh, to President Hogarty, and my thanks to all of you for attending this evening. This concludes the 2019 De Bruyne Memorial Lecture. Please do join us in the foyer just outside for a reception and safe home. Thank you. Thank you.